From Chicago, Illinois, the Voice of Prophecy presents live The Midnight Cry with Kenneth Cox, an adventure in understanding where we are in the light of Bible prophecy. Heavenly Father, tonight as we open your word, we ask that our hearts may be open. Pray, Lord, that they may be soft, they may be tender, that we may hear the voice of your Spirit, and that as we listen to your Spirit, that each one of us may be willing to follow. Give us wisdom, give us understanding, and give us faith to walk with you. For this we ask in Christ's name, amen. All you have to do is ask any child, any school children, what the poem that was written by Longfellow is, and just quote a few stanzas of it. It says, listen, my children, and you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And every child recognizes that poem. They remember the story, how those colonists were faced with an invasion from England and how they had decided that there in the tower of the North Church in Boston that if the British were coming by land, they would hang one landron. If the British were coming by sea, they would hang two. Paul Revere took a boat and rowed across the bay over to Charleston. And there he waited to see if that lantern would show in the belfry of the church tower. And sure enough, at midnight, there in that tower was hanging two lanterns saying that the British were coming by sea. And Paul Revere began his famous ride, riding through all the towns and the villages, shouting, wake up, wake up. The British are coming. Wake up! And those men, as they heard the cry of Paul Revere, rose up and put their clothes on and took their rifles and went out to defend the colonies. They were called Minute Men. And they stood for something, and the cry went out across the whole area. Wake up! The British are coming. In the Bible, it speaks of another cry a cry that is given to you and to me at midnight. I want you to listen to what the Word of God says about it. It's found in Mark, the 13th chapter, starting with verse 35, and it says, Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. All right, he said, listen, watch. You don't know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster or in the morning. You don't know when it's going to take place. Lest coming suddenly he find you, what? Find you sleeping. He said, watch out, be prepared. The master's coming back. You don't know when it's going to be, but he's going to come. So listen to the words of Christ himself. He says, and what I say to you, I say to all, watch said, I'm saying that to everyone. Watch, be prepared. Now, folks, this cry that's given where the Lord's saying, you don't know when this is going to happen. You don't know when the master of the house is coming back. Be prepared. Watch. He is speaking to Christians. That is the call that is being given to Christians. Awake. Watch. To those that have accepted Jesus Christ, he's saying, wake up. Watch because you don't know when I'm coming back. Oh, you say, oh, Brother Cox, I'm so weary of watching. I've been watching so long, I'm tired of watching. Remind me of the old minister I was talking to. He said, oh, when I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, I thought I wouldn't be able to go to school. I thought the Lord would come before I could go away to school. Then he said, I went away to school, 
and I thought, I'll never make it through school. And he said, I went all the way through school. And then he said, when I got out of school, I said, well, I won't have long in the ministry. And he said, now I've spent all these years in the ministry and I've retired. I'm so tired. I'm so weary of watching and waiting. The Lord said, be careful. Watch out. Don't become indifferent. Don't say, well, I'm tired. I'm just going to go on and forget about that. I'm going to go about life. It's time that I do something else. I, I, it's, they've said that for years. I run on to people all the time that tell me that. They say, oh, Brother Cox, we have heard this for years. I've just become indifferent about it. And then I run on to some people who say, I've been so disappointed. So disappointed. I didn't believe we would ever make it into a new millennium. Why, I thought the Lord would have come long before now. So disappointed that he hasn't come back. I don't know that the Lord's going to come back. The scripture has some special counsel to you and to me about that. This is what it says. 2 Peter, the third chapter, in verse 3, knowing this first, that scoffers will come. When? In the last days. He said, now know that scoffers are going to come in the last days. Okay, that's the time in which you and I are living. We'll find that out tonight. It's going to come in the last days. What are they scoffing about? And saying, where is the promise of his coming? They're scoffing about that. They're saying, where's the promise of his coming? Why doesn't he come back? For all things continue as they were. Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Oh, he said, so disappointed. Dear friend, let me tell you something. Hang on. The promises of God's word are sure. They do not fail. Never do they fail. The promises he gives when he says he will come back, indeed, he will come back. Don't go through life and become careless about the, your relationship with the Jesus Christ. Don't become careless about your belief and what you're holding on to. I run to people and say, oh, Brother Cox, we don't know when the Lord's coming. Why, it could be a thousand years from now. We don't have any idea when the Lord's going to come back. Well, I want you to listen to a scripture. This is what it tells us in 1 Thessalonians. It speaks of Jesus coming, as some people say, as a thief in the night. Listen. By concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Paul saying, now concerning the times and seasons, I really shouldn't have to write to you, okay? For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. People say, well, see right there, it says that Jesus is going to come back as a thief in the night. Let me tell you something tonight. If Jesus comes back as a thief in the night to you, you're lost. If Jesus comes back as a thief in the night to you, you're lost. Let's go on. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. Now, Listen very carefully. But you, brethren, see, this call is to Christians. This call is to people that have accepted Jesus Christ. This call is to people who believe the word of God. You, brethren, that's talking about people that have accepted Christ. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. You're not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. He said, no, you're not in darkness that that day should come upon you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We're not of night. We are not of night. 
nor of darkness, said, you're sons of light. That day's not to come upon you unaware. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. No, don't become careless. The promises of God are sure. He's coming back just exactly like he said he would come back. Jesus himself gave a parable, a parable that deals with this midnight cry. And he speaks of some very definite things concerning Christians today. This is what he says. Talks about ten virgins. Listen. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps went out to meet the... Okay, so these ten virgins, they've gone out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish, okay? Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Those were the foolish ones, okay? But the wise took all in their vessels with their lamps. So we have two groups here. They're all virgins. They've all gone out to meet the bridegroom. One took oil with them. The other didn't take any oil with them. Now, while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. All of them, church members, they all slumbered and slept. I'm afraid we've been doing a little bit of that, slumbering and sleeping, okay? But the cry is given. And at midnight, at midnight a cry was heard. That means right down at the end. Midnight there means the darkest hour of this earth's history. The cry is given, behold, the bridegroom comes. Heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. That was the cry that was given. Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps. All of them arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. They said, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. We didn't bring any oil with us. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. They said, If we give you oil, we won't have enough. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. While those five were out looking for oil, the bridegroom came and those five wives went in and the door was shut. Now listen very carefully to what the scripture says here because what I'm going to read to you now is most important. Afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. They got the oil, they went back, they knocked on the door, they said, Lord, open the door to us. And he answered and said, As surely I say to you, I do not know you. I do not know you. Terrible, terrible. They didn't make it in. He said, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. God says, watch. You don't know when the Son of Man's coming. The call has come. If you're not ready, if you, aren't, if you don't have the oil, you're not going to be able to go in and the door will be shut and he'll say, I don't know you. Those wise virgins, they went in. The foolish didn't. Now there's some things that you need to know about these virgins. Let's look at what it tells us about these 
ten virgins. One, they all accepted the truth of God's Word, all of them. I mean, they're all church members. They're all followers. They're all believers. They all accept the truth of God's Word, all ten virgins, okay? I, this call I'm talking about right now, folks, is to Christians. It's to people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. These all ten are followers of Jesus Christ. Secondly, all ten of them are advocates of the truth. If you were to ask any one of them, they would have told you, yes, this is what we believe. This is what we stand for. They all were advocates of the truth of God's Word. Thirdly, they all are attracted to those who believe the truth. They're all, all ten of them are there. They're church members. They're the people, different ones that serve in the church. They could be ones that sing in the choir. They're attracted to each other. They like to go to church. That's these ten virgins. Now let's take a look at the facts. The facts are that five of them were wise. They had oil and they went in. Five were foolish. They didn't take any oil with them. You see, without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of His truth is of no avail. Oh, I know lots of people who read the Word of God and it doesn't do them any good. You see, without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of the Word of God won't do you any good. I know people that believe, but they don't have any of the oil. You see, the oil represents the Holy Spirit, and unless the Holy Spirit is there to touch your heart and to work on your heart, it won't do you any good. And those five foolish virgins, they didn't take any oil with them. They were lacking the Spirit of God. So what happened? Here's the terrible facts. The five foolish, the door was shut, and he said to them what? I do not know you. I don't know you. You see, 50% of them didn't make it. 50% of them didn't make it into the kingdom of God. Is it possible, is it possible to know all this and be lost, to miss eternal life? Is it possible that a person could accept the truths of God, could be an advocate of the truth, could enjoy going to church and miss heaven? Is that possible? Well, there's several places in Scripture that gives us a good idea. Listen to what it says here in Matthew the seventh chapter, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? Now, these are people that have cast out demons. They, they have prophesied in the name of the Lord. There are certainly people that would advocate the truth, would they not? And listen to what he says to them. And then I will declare to them, what? I never knew you. Same thing that he told those five foolish virgins. I don't know you. Here, these people had prophesied in his name, cast out demons, and he says, sorry, I don't know you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I don't, I don't know who you are. In fact, Jesus told of an experience that he had. He told of a young man, a rich, young ruler that came to see him. If you remember that experience, it goes like this. And behold, one came to him, came, said to him, Good master, 
What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Say, good master, tell me what good thing I must do to have eternal life. In Matthew 19, he goes on and he says, So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? Now, what Jesus was trying to get out of that young man was him to acknowledge that he was the Savior. That's why he, was, why he said, Why do you call me good? But listen to this, what Jesus says to him now. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said, oh, if you want to enter into life, if you want to have eternal life, keep the commandments. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? I mean, here is a young man that from his youth has kept the commandments of God. And by the way, I can read to you in one of the other Gospels where it says that when Jesus looked upon this young man, he loved him. So this young man's not lying. He's telling the truth. And he said, all this I have done from my youth, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give to the poor. He said, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Do you, do you catch the significance there? Do you catch the significance? Come and what? Follow me. You see, there's a difference there between I do not know you and follow me. He's saying, if you want to get into eternal life, sell what you have, give it to the poor, come and follow me, walk with me, come and be with me, get acquainted with me, spend time with me, learn to know me. That's what he's saying to this young man. So what about today? What does the scripture say that the conditions are today? Where do you and I stand? As far as the scripture is concerned, it says, in the last days, perilous times will come. 2 Timothy, the third chapter. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Having a form of godliness. Go to church, yes. But don't know anything about the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, having a form of godliness, but no relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what the call is to the church, to those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, to those that today say, I'm a Christian. God is saying, wake up. Wake up. Come to know me. Get acquainted with me. Have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the call that he is given in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying to you and to me. Get ready. I'm coming back. Come to know me as a personal Savior. Jesus told many, many parables. Tonight I'd like to tell you a modern-day par parable that might illustrate what I'm trying to tell you tonight. Uh, we'll call the parable, The Night I Was Too Busy, okay? It was on a Saturday night. And I had just sat down, or the man had just sat down, to watch an episode on television. Had sat down and had watched the first segment of it. And when the commercial break came, 
uh, he went to the kitchen and got him a piece of cake and a glass of milk and uh, came in and watched the second episode or the second part of it of Lethal Weapon, okay, watching Lethal Weapon. And then when the next uh, commercial break came, he decided to have another piece of cake. Went in to watch the last episode of Lethal Weapon. This is the most interesting part because this is when Danny Glover and Mel Gibson are about to capture the enemy. And right in the very heart of that episode, down the stairs came his little sister yelling, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And he said, shh, be quiet. I'm watching Lethal Ep Weapon. And she said, no, Jesus is coming. I've seen him. And he said, shh, be quiet. She said, no, I need to go out and meet him. You need to come with me. Jesus is coming. And he said, I'll go ahead and go on. I I'll be out in a minute. Strange that Jesus would come right in the middle, right at the very end of Lethal Weapon and spoil the very whole last part of it. And right in the midst of that dynamic part when everything is happening, they decided to take a commercial break. And he said, well, while we're having a commercial break, I'll go out and meet Jesus. Uh, probably can say in five minutes everything I have to say. And so he goes out, opens the door, and everything's dark. And he said, terrible. Why would he come? Why would he come very in the last part of Lethal Weapon and not even say hi? Said, oh, well, it's dark. I'll go in and get some root beer and popcorn and enjoy an evening of watching TV. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? You see, he said, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. Concerning the coming of Jesus Christ, it says that if you and I are going to enter into life, this is what we must do. And this is eternal life. This is eternal life that they may know you the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that they may know you. If you want to enter into life, dear friends, then you have to become acquainted with Jesus Christ. You're not going to have eternal life if you don't. Going to church won't get it done. You can go to church and not know Jesus Christ. It's even possible for you to read the Word of God and not know Jesus Christ. You've got to know Him. Who is this Jesus Christ? Who is He that I need to know? And tonight, for this first part, I've talked to those that are Christians, those of you who go to church. I'd like to take a little time to talk to those of you who may not know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Who is he? God up in heaven, the Father. This is what he said about him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father said, This is my beloved Son. That's who he is. He is the Son of God. There is no one else. He is the only one. That is the Son of God. John the Baptist, as he stood there on the banks of the Jordan River, and Jesus come walking down the Jordan River, John said this about him. And the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said here in John 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John said, He is the Lamb of God. That means, dear friend tonight, no matter who you are, Jesus Christ was the sacrifice for your sins. He died for you. He paid the price that you rightfully owe. He paid. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's what John the Baptist said about him. Peter, 
when Peter was asked who he was, Peter, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And asked him, Who is he? Peter said, He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Tonight, if you don't know him, then tonight he is the Savior, the Son of God. When Jesus spoke about who he was, Jesus said this. Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. Huh? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Oh, he said, I'm the light of the world. That person that comes to me will not walk in darkness. No, won't walk in darkness. In the scripture, it gives you an insight to what Jesus Christ will do for you tonight. What is the light? What is the light that Jesus Christ gives? Acts 26, verse 18, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith. So it says the first thing that Christ does is he opens your eyes. You see, dear friend, you can't see if your eyes are shut. And I run on to a lot of people that won't open their eyes. Their eyes are shut. And the Lord Jesus Christ wants to open your eyes tonight so you can see. I got on the plane, sat down, and this fellow came in and sat down beside me. He was very talkative. And uh, as we were flying, he began to tell me about a book he had just bought at the bookstore, told me it was a bestseller, and how it was recommended so high and how anxious he was to read it. Now, the book was not very big, just kind of a thin little book, and the name of the book was Who Moved My Cheese? That was the name of the book, Who Moved My Cheese? And so as we flew, he read this little book, and when he finished it, he began to rave what a marvelous book it was, and then he looked at me and he said, Would you like to read it? And I said, Sure, I'd like to read it. So he handed it to me, and so as we flew along, I read the little book. What the book is about is not being afraid to move out of your comfort zone. That's what it's about. Not being, a will, not being afraid to change, not being afraid to look at new things and to accept changes that take place. That's what the little book is all about. And I enjoyed it. It was a great little book. When I finished reading it, I told him how much I enjoyed the little book, how much I appreciated him letting me read it. Then I decided in my own mind that I'd see how much good it had done. So I said to him, I said, you know, I have a little book that I just finished reading that really is a fabulous little book. It's called Almost Home, and it's on Bible prophecy, and it kind of tells us where we are today, and I thought you might like to read it. And I pulled it out of my briefcase, and he took it, and he said, what did you say about it was about? And I said, oh, it's about Bible prophecy. And he handed it back to me and said, no, thank you. Now, you see, dear friend, it didn't get him out of his comfort zone. You see, if your eyes are closed, you can't see. So Jesus Christ comes to open your eyes. And when your eyes are open, something marvelously begins to happen because it says in order to turn them from darkness to light. You see, you've got to open your eyes to know that you're in darkness. If you keep your eyes closed all the time, you don't know whether there's light or there's darkness. Your eyes are shut, but when you open your eyes, you can tell whether you're in darkness or whether you're in light. And Jesus said, listen, I've come to open your eyes so that you will turn from darkness to light. That's what Jesus Christ is going to do for you. I can tell you tonight, if you have never known Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, when you accept him, oh, dear friends, how he brings in the light and how everything looks different. 
I mean, he changes things. And things that you once loved, all of a sudden they aren't near as attractive to you. And some of those things that you didn't care about, all of a sudden you enjoy. He changes you, makes you different so that you enjoy the light. Brings that to you. Dear friend, it can only be experienced. Sorry. I can tell you about it, but you can only know about it by experience. If you're going to sit back and say, well, I don't know, uh, you never experience it. But when you give your heart to the Lord and you experience it, what a change comes over your life. And then he said, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. It says that he turns you from darkness to light, light that you might receive what? The forgiveness of sin. He says, listen, I'll take you just like you are. I'll accept you just like you are. I welcome you into my family. I'll forgive you of all your sins. And dear friend, let me tell you tonight, I don't care how dark your sins may be. The Bible says that he will forgive all manner of sin. Listen. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? It says that if you and I come to him and we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He's faithful. That means that heaven is open for business 24 hours a day. It means that you can come to him any time and if you confess your sins, he'll forgive you. And it says that he is faithful and just. That means that he won't treat me one way and you another way. If he'll forgive me of my sins, he'll forgive you of your sins. That's what it means. That our sins can be forgiven. He will do that for you and for me. Ephesians 1, 7 in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So tonight, it doesn't make any difference how dark your past may have been. It doesn't make any difference, dear friend, how terrible your sins may have been. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. There is no sin that it won't cleanse. You see, I have at home in my laundry room some spot remover. Some of it says, super spot remover but none of it ever seems to do a very good job but let me tell you the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses all sin not any sin that it won't cleanse and then it says the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace ah marvelous the riches of his grace this fellow had a dream. He dreamed he went to heaven. When he got to heaven, he was met by Peter at Peter's gate. And Peter welcomed him to heaven. And they had a nice talk, and then Peter, as they were talking, said to him, said, well, if you want to come on inside, you have to have 100 points. And the fellow said, well... How do I go about getting 100 points? And Peter said, well, 
What have you done? Oh, he said, I lived a good life. He said, I have a family. I've tried to be a good husband. I've tried to be a good father. I've tried to do good things in the community. I, I've lived a good life. I've gone to church. I've, I've been very supportive in the community. I've done a lot of good things. And Peter said, well, okay, that's worth a point. A point. He said, worth what? He said, oh, that, that's worth a point. And he said, you mean my whole life? Everything that I did is only worth one point, that's all? And Peter said, don't you have anything else? He said, well, yeah, when I, when I died, he said, I left uh, a large amount of money to the church. He said, all the things that I have saved, I, I left to the church to forward the gospel and to help the poor. He said, I gave all that to the church. Peter said, well, yeah, he said, that's worth another point. He, he said, you mean, you mean all, all that I've done all my life and all the things that I saved and everything that I gave to the church, that's only worth two points? Peter said, that's right. He said, there's no way on earth I'll get in there except by the grace of God. And Peter said, that's worth 100 points. Now, dear friend, that's the way it works. It's by the grace of God. You see, it's not because you're worth it. It's not because you did something that makes you worth it. It's not because you're intelligent. It's not because you are good-looking. It's not because of what you've done. It's because of Jesus Christ. Because of him that he died for you and by his grace he takes his blood and he cleanses you from all sin. That is because of what Jesus Christ did for you and for me. And dear friend, that is why it is so absolutely vital that you know him. You see, if you don't know him, he can't do anything for you. He can go to church, but dear friends, if you don't know him, if you don't have a relationship with him, when that time comes, he'll have to say, sorry, I don't know you. I don't know you. Very important. To open the eyes of the blind, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Sanctified by what? Sanctified means changing your life. That means what the Lord Jesus Christ does for you. How are we sanctified? By faith. Get it clear, folks. You're sanctified by faith. 1 John 5, 4. What, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Ever read the story of Abraham of old? Came out one evening, looked up in the sky, and God said, Abraham, you ought to tidy the place up here because there's going to be a baby born. Abraham said, good Lord, who's going to have a baby? Lot's wife or one of the servants? God said, no, Abraham, your wife Sarah is going to have a baby. In fact, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, and your offspring will be like the stars of the heaven and like the sands of the sea. And Abraham said, oh, Lord, that's wonderful, wonderful that you're going to give us a baby. I've always wanted a son. And he went running home, and he said, Sarah, Sarah, guess what? We're going to have a baby. She said, we are. She said, Abraham, you've forgotten something. You've forgotten that I am 65 years old. You're 75 years old. I'm past the time of life to have a child. I can't have a child. And Abraham said, Sarah, I wasn't hearing things. And, you know, every time... They got around. That's all Abraham could talk about was having another baby, having a baby, having a baby. Till Sarah got tired of talking about it. Year after year passed, no baby. 
And finally, Sarah said, Abraham, why don't you take my handmaiden, Hagar, and have a son by her? And so Abraham took Hagar and had a son by her, and God said, Abraham, I didn't say a word about Hagar. I said Sarah was going to have a son. Now, 25 years pass, folks. 25 years pass. And here Christ comes talking to Abraham, told him he's going to have a son. And it says Abraham's now 100 years old. Sarah, she's 90. And when he said, Abraham, you're going to have a son, Abraham just fell on the ground and started laughing, said, you've waited too long. Sarah, she was listening at it in the tent, and she started laughing. You'd laugh too if some sister here stood up 90 years old and told us she was pregnant. You'd all say, oh, she's senile. That's what you do. But folks, have you ever considered how embarrassing that was? Huh? Because Abraham... And Sarah, they traveled. They were kind of nomads. And when God told him he's going to give him a son, he changed their names. He changed his Abram's name to Abraham, from Abram to Abraham, and Sarai to Sarah. Do you know what those names meant? Abraham means father of nations. Sarah means mother of nations. And so here they come walking up to this village, and as they did back in here, then all the elders are sitting out in the front of the village. And they say, welcome to our village. And Abraham said, thank you. And they say, what's your name? He said, oh, my name's Father of Nations. They said, your wife, oh, this is my wife, Mother of Nations. Well, how many children do you have? We don't have any. <laughs> Terrible. Why? Why would God wait 25 years? So waiting so that Abraham would get so old that he couldn't reproduce. Said, Abraham, since you wouldn't listen, I'll just wait you out, and when you're so old you can't reproduce, then I'll give you a son. Listen, that's what it says in Romans. Romans, the fourth chapter. Not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already, what? Dead. That meant he couldn't reproduce since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced of what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Listen, folks. Therefore, it was accounted to him for what? Righteousness. By faith, Abraham hung on. That was counted to him as righteousness. It is our faith that overcomes the world. Hang on. Jesus Christ will do wonderful things for you. How can I find direction for my life? Let me tell you quickly how you can find direction for your life. You see, there's some people that make decisions. They think they're the right decisions, but they're the wrong ones and they lead to death. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You see, I can't trust my own ability. I can't do that, dear friend, and if tonight you're trusting your own ability, you're on dangerous ground. Proverbs 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not, lean not to your own understanding. Don't put your trust in your ability. Put your trust in the Word of God. Don't lean on your own ability. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. So if you want to know what's the right way, then, dear friend, get out that Bible, read it, Commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and read it to have a personal relationship with Him. Read it to understand and listen to His voice as He speaks to you. It will change your life and make you different. Jesus Christ is saying that He is the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want eternal life, Jesus Christ is the way. Now, where are we in the stream of time? Where do we stand? It says that the cry is given at midnight. That's what it says. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bride is co bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. The Bible gives you two indicators of helping you know where you are in the stream of time. Those two indicators are these. One is the prophetic timeline. That's what prophecy is for. Prophecy is given to help you and I know where we are in the stream of time. That's why God gives prophecy. The other is signs of Christ's return. For instance, in Matthew, the 24th chapter, Jesus Christ himself gave 17 signs of his coming. Of those 17 signs, 16 have been fulfilled. Can I trust these two indicators to tell me where I am in the stream of time? Listen, this is what the Bible tells you. 2 Peter 1, 19, we have the what? We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. So he said, if anything is sure, it's the prophetic word. You can trust it. So starting tomorrow night, we're going to begin to take the prophecies and take them step by step and we'll bring them right on down to the time in which you and I are living. Concerning the signs, Jesus said, so you also, when you see all these things, you see all these things, all these signs, know that it is near at the door. So those are indicators that help you and I know where we are today. What is the danger today? What's the danger for you? and for me today. This is the danger. But take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life that that day come upon you unexpectedly. That's the danger. The danger that we have today is that the coming of Jesus Christ will come upon you unexpectedly being so involved with the things of this life, so concerned with making a living, so concerned with taking care of the things of this life that I miss eternal life. Jesus made a comparison to it. And he said, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. He said, Now it's like the days of Noah so will the days of the Son of Man be. Let's see what the days of Noah were like. For as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. That meant they were going on about life as usual. They were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, not really very concerned about really what was taking place until the day that Noah entered the ark. Okay? So they were just going on about life as usual. Now listen, I want you to listen very carefully to the next words. And did not know. Terrible words. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Didn't know till the flood came, took them all away so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Sometimes in our schedule, it's rather hectic. Sometimes we have to go for months, even years, without vacations. And for the last couple years, it's been that way, uh, just constantly from one meeting to another. And here, about a year ago now, we received an invitation to speak at a convention in Sacramento. 
And so since we hadn't had a break, uh, Gordon and Donna Klein that work with me, and I decided that we would uh, catch a plane and fly up to Seattle. And there in Seattle, we would uh, take the Clipper, a ship, from Seattle over to Victoria, and we would spend a couple days just sightseeing and relaxing in Victoria, go out to the Bushard Gardens and, uh, and just enjoy the scenery and, and relax a little bit. And then we would come back, uh, take the Clipper back to Seattle, uh, spend the night there, spend a day in Seattle sightseeing, and then catch the Amtrak train that night, get us a berth, and sleep overnight and get up and be in Sacramento the next morning. That was our plans. So we did. We flew up to Seattle, caught the Clipper, went to Victoria, enjoyed two wonderful days in Victoria, just looking at the scenery and enjoying the area. Uh, caught the Clipper back to Seattle and spent the night. The next morning I got up, we weren't rushed. I had a very leisure breakfast, enjoyed it very much. And then went up to the room and spent some time just reading and praying with no schedule or anything, just enjoying, spending time with the Lord. And then when I had finished my devotions, I said to Gordon and Donna, I said, uh, well, let's go look at some things here in Seattle. But I said, you know, I don't want to lug this suitcase around all day. And I had this big suitcase, and I said, I, I just don't want to lug it around all day. You reckon I could call Amtrak and see if they'd let me check it in early? So I called up Amtrak, and I told him, I said, I have a train, uh, a train to catch with you this evening, and I'm here in Seattle. I don't want to lug this all day. Uh, I'm wondering if you'd let me check it in early. They said, sure, Mr. Cox, you can check it in early. They said, what's the number of your train? And I said, the number of the train I'm catching is this number, and it leaves tonight at 945. And there was silence on the other end. And the man spoke up and said, Mr. Cox, your train leaves at 945 this morning. That was 940, folks. Only by the grace of God did we make that train. But I hope you're getting my point. Did not know. Did not know until all of a sudden, there it was. So, the scripture says, will the coming of the Son of Man be tonight? I want to ask you, are you ready for Jesus to come? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Can you look into his face and say, this is my God? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, tonight we ask that each one of us may be ready for Jesus to come. May we know you personally as a Savior. May our hearts be surrendered to you. For this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that our hearts may respond to the wonderful invitation that Jesus gives to each of us to accept him as our Savior and to find life eternal in him. For this we ask in his name. Amen.